most one of the most luxurious places to, to read that you can possibly imagine, just on down at the uh, water's edge near Dunavity Rock here behind me, which is the scene of one of the major rule of law events in Scottish history. And the book I'm just going to uh, draw your attention to a few aspects of in this respect is uh, Kintyre in the 17th century written in 1950, I think, by Andrew McCarroll, written a long time ago, 1948, uh, but republished by, in 2001 by a splendid organisation that I'm a member of called the Kintyre Antiquarian and Natural History Society. And um, it uh, describes what happened here in the key century when the rule of law was fought over in Britain generally, Great Britain and Ireland too. Um, with mixed results it was a significant progress was achieved in some places and uh, uh, in other places not so much, Ireland particularly in the latter case. And the Highlands of Scotland were somewhere in between. Now the significance of Dunavity here is that this is where one of the most notorious massacres in Scottish history happened. And the background is interesting. The thing is that just over there is the coast of Antrim and just around the corner is Rathlin Island where Robert the Bruce hid famously. And when the kings of Scotland decided that they really had to establish control over the, the, the highlands and islands, they started with the uh, forfeiture sand flies here again, we started with a forfeiture of the Lordship of the Isles, which since the Middle Ages had become the ruling force here, based at Danuvig Castle on Isla, right next to where I used to live when I was on Isla, and at the head of the bay where I used to anchor my boat that I did the Isles of the West and Isles of the North trips on. The population in Kintyre was a mixed Gallic and uh, Norse population, like over much of this coast, and pretty lawless and difficult to control because there were a few roads in the centre of Scotland across the mountains, there were tracks, but nothing much more than that. And communication here was by boats, these beautiful Berlins, the long boats, uh, oh, derived from long boats. And um, so this area was kind of a law unto itself. So the rule of the state didn't really run here. It was a certain amount of um, control over the main chiefs, but really very little. When King James the Sixth, later King James the First, the father of Charles the First, who precipitated the English Civil War and the really, in the end, after which uh, was established the beginnings of the rule of law. James VI decided he ought to do something about this and he started trying to rein in these chiefs and these clan chiefs and they were half Irish because this is the area not far from here about a mile two miles away is a place where St Columba is reputed to have first set foot in Scotland and also where in the 6th century the first of the Irish Scots as they were called came over to colonise the west of Scotland, bringing with them Christianity. It wasn't an entirely negative thing, but they, um, they evolved into a, into a race of um, people who became a nuisance to the, to the increasingly orderly and lowlandish regime in Edinburgh. To cut a very long story short, by the time we got through to the mid-17th century and the, when Protestantism was really becoming a, a major issue in Scotland and there was a covenanting government in Edinburgh and all that sort of thing, uh, there was a kind of a sort of rebellion um, led by a character called Col Kitto who was a, an old man. Uh, he had a young son who did most of the damage and another young son, uh, <clears throat> who was a younger son, who was called Sir Alexander MacDonald, who came here. Anyway, James decided he was going to do something about all this lawlessness. He passed the statute, or he promulgated the Statutes of Ion in 1609, which attempted to rein in these Highland chiefs and force them to have their sons educated in Edinburgh and to learn English and all that sort of thing. A kind of rebellion broke out. The, MacDonalds, 
who were the, 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 uh, the ruling clan and were uh, the sort of sworn enemies of the Campbells, who were, the, if you like, the government clan, basically came and plundered Kintyre. The government sent, sent in 1647, they sent a, a force out here to extirpate the rebels who had taken over the, the, you know, the lands of Kintyre and had, were sort of headquartered partly in Campbelltown and partly here. Again, neither castle survives. The, Ca the Campbelltown Castle, the Lochhead, Lochhead Castle it was called, where it's, it's thought to have been situated where Castle Hill now is in Campbelltown, but there's nothing left of it at all here. There and there's nothing left of the castle that's supposed to be here. But this was a major, major place. I mean, um, the Scottish king had come and been entertained here. Robert the Bruce had, had visited here and all sorts of things. It was a major, major headquarters, latterly, of the Campbells. So the Macdonalds came and chased them all away, took over the area, and in 1647, they, uh, the Scottish uh, government, parliament, covenanting parliament, commissioned a very interesting man called David Leslie, who had fought for the Russians in the recapture of Smolensk um, in the 1630s, in the famous Russian-Polish war. And he came here with a force, and they, they, he marched from uh, Dunblane down to Tarbert, and at just south of Tarbert, he, they fought a battle with the forces of the, the Macdonalds, and they beat them. The Macdonalds retreated to Cameltown, they pursued them to Cameltown. Uh, this is in May 1647. All these events took place roughly this time of year, just about a week or so earlier. They pursued them to Campbelltown and the, the, the Macdonalds realised the cause was lost. They were never going to beat the Scottish crown. Uh, their reign was over. They sent a lot of the Irish people back to Ireland and um, about in, in 16 boats, 800 of them. And the rest of them came and holed up here on this rock. And in Leslie's forces, you know, slow and steady, covenanting, Protestant, experienced man, fought all over Europe, for initially in the Swedish army, then in the Russian army. He came down here and the, the McDonald's and their allies, including McDonald's from Sander Island and all other places, there was 300 of them holed up in this rock, on this rock here, which is really tiny to go up there and see. Well, I, don't, I can't imagine they were all there. They must have been, you know, whatever. But anyway, they were there, apparently. Leslie cut off the water supply. After a few days, they couldn't, they couldn't survive, so they came out and they said, you know, we surrender and uh, can we have terms? And apparently they were promised terms. Otherwise, I don't know what they'd have done. Maybe jumped off the cliff into the sea and swam off. Well, they could, I mean, they had some, they were still alive, where there's life, there's hope. And uh, anyway, they surrendered and they were all massacred. The whole lot of them. One of the major war crimes of Scottish history. There were plenty of them in the Highlands. This was unusual, really, in early modern times, and certainly in the 17th century, for government forces to carry on like this. Wasn't it? Wasn't, um, it wasn't exceptional, it wasn't, it wasn't unique at, at the Battle of Philip Hall where he'd uh, defeated the, the, the royal forces on behalf of the, the Covenant and Parliament of Scotland. There had been a massacre of uh, surrendered Irish, not the Scots, but the Irish who'd surrendered. They were considered not to be legitimate uh, soldiers of war and they were, they were massacred. So that was a, a terrible thing. But these people here were Scottish, which made a difference in those days in terms of their legitimacy as, as rebels. But this book is extremely interesting on how this uh, whole thing came about and also what the situation was as a result of this gross abuse of what we might call the rule of law, although it hadn't really been developed. But the only person who wrote a memoir of this was uh, Leslie's second in command, uh, a man called Sir James Turner, who was from Edinburgh way. And he said, according to, according to uh, Andrew McCarroll, a very scholarly work this, the besieged had fair conditions offered them for their persons and baggage if they would give over the house, that's the house of Dun uh, Dunavity, 
And this they stiffly refused to do. We're not surrendering, they said. Expecting relief. In other words, they're expecting forces to come to their aid. Um, which never which never came. Uh, there's a question as whether they, the promise of them had been genuinely meant. But these offers, if actually made as Turner states, were presumably made as soon as Leslie had arrived at the fortress, and if they were refused, then, as Turner holds, the besieged, by the laws of war, forfeited any claim to mercy. And that is absolutely true. That's the way the Mongols worked. That's the way the Duke of Wellington worked at the Peninsula War at the Siege of San Sebastian, for example, to thing later. That's how Cromwell worked at the sieges of Drogheda and Wexford in Ireland. Uh, that was just the laws of war at the time. That was the custom. In other words, that was the law, insofar as that word is meaningful in such circumstances. However, it was not necessary to kill them, as was shown by the fact that a month later, having taken this fortress, Leslie went over to Danuvik on Isla, and the main body of the Macdonalds there surrendered in a similar sort of way at Danuvik Castle, and they were not massacred. Some people say Leslie had an attack of conscience, who knows. But it's a very, very interesting um, event in the sense that it, it's a reflection on this business of how do you enforce the rule of law amongst very, very lawless people, as the Highlanders were. I mean, they were forever raiding. They didn't respect the, the customs of, of you know, the, the British Isles. So what does Britain do? Do you allow, as it were, terrorists to terrorise terrorize you or do you take... Um, effective action. That's all the lead up to this little passage, which I think is, is very interesting. It's just two paragraphs. The massacre shocked the public conscience of Scotland at the time, and it was natural that there should have been much discussion as to the responsibility of such an exalted personage as the Marquis of Argyll, who was in a sense in charge of the, I mean, he'd appointed Leslie to the command of this army. Uh, personage as the Marcus of Argyll, in, in whose case the motives for revenge must have been strong, because of course the Campbells, the Marcus of Argyll being a Campbell, of course, uh, you know, Campbells and Macdonalds were ancient enemies, and maybe he wanted revenge. On the 9th of May 1647, the Committee of Estates had addressed a letter to General Leslie to the effect that in all matters pertaining to the pardoning of the rebels, he was to take the advice of the Marcus. Leslie must have had these instructions in his pocket at Dunavity, and it is incredible, considering this fact and the powers which the Marquis possessed by reason of his commission already referred to, that Leslie would have dared to order the massacre if the Marquis had said pardon. Marcus is undoubtedly a crafty man, but there is no evidence that he was a cruel man. And the reason for this and other massacres is to be sought for in the religious fanaticism of the Covenanters. This is where it gets really very modern. You know, political correctness. Which other lives do you sacrifice for your principles? Every now and again, Andrew McCarroll says, very appositely in my opinion, written in 1948, here we are in 2020, I think it's still true, every now and again arise in the world men or nations or sects who imagine that they are God's chosen instruments to set the world right. This belief the Covenanters and their clergy in particular held in full measure. In his evidence at Argyle's trial in 1661, Sir James Turner testified that he had never heard the Marcus advise Leslie to proceed to the massacre, but that, on the other hand, Mr John Neve, the chaplain, had never ceased to urge it. He is actually said to have preached a sermon from the text in Samuel what meaneth this bleating of sheep and this lowing of, of oxen in order to work on the superstitious mind of Argyle? Such ministers drew from a contemporary historian, Sir James Balfour of Den Milne, the following criticism, quote, The best instruments misapplied do greatest mischief and prove most dangerous to any state, as of the sweetest wine is made the sharpest vinegar, so churchmen who by their holy function and robes of innocence should be the sweetest of all professions, who should breathe nothing but peace, unity, allegiance and love, if they misapply their talent and abandon themselves to the spirit of faction, they become the bitterest enemies and the most corroding cankers and the worst vipers in any commonwealth. 
I think we can all think of contemporary examples of that eternal truth. Twenty years later, under the misgovernment and tyranny of Charles II in Scotland, this fanaticism became transmuted into a passion of resistance and a struggle for freedom of conscience which arouses our highest admiration. But in 1645 and 1647 it was judged by present-day standards, fanaticism pure and simple, and the massacres of Philip Hoare and Dunavity have cast an indelible stain on the pages of covenanting history. And that happened right here, where I'm sitting, listening to the sea quietly lapping the shores of this beautiful, sunny, but I must say extremely windy day. Um, so, there we are. That's today's book. And very interesting and should cause us to reflect on the rule of law. To, to what extent is it necessary to use unlawful methods against enemies of the rule of law? Think about it.